to the Giles Files, and my name is Nancy Giles. And we're talking to Robin Gavon, R-O-B-I-N, and it's G-I-V like Victor, H-A-N, and um, I'm the senior critic at large for the Washington Post. Senior so, critic at large. Yeah, I never really understood what at large meant uh, until I got to be at large. And <laughs> so, yeah, it, as, it really just means that you um, can roam. Yeah, yes. I'm free range now. <laughs> Yeah, she's free range and a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist for, and I quote, her witty, closely observed essays that transform fashion criticism into cultural criticism. Born and raised in Detroit, Robin was an English major at Princeton and she went on to get a master's in journalism from the University of Michigan. Then she worked at the Detroit Free Press, the San Francisco Chronicle, was an associate editor at Vogue, Woo. and her writings have appeared in Harper's Bazaar, Essence, The New Yorker, and The Daily Beast, among other places. So here's how I found out about Robin. It was, like so many things, through my dear friend Aaron Moriarty of CBS News, because Aaron is the keeper of all that is smart and wise. Robin and Aaron used to go to the same spin class on the Upper West Side, and Robin was doing fashion writing then for the Washington Post, and she was so interesting. And I thought, hmm, we got to get her for the podcast. So one of the things that your writing has put in my mind, again, is how clothing and culture and politics are kind of all one thing. Like, I was thinking of the piece that you wrote about Dick Cheney wearing that... A parka in that big meeting with the Russian guys and then connecting that to Bernie Sanders doing the same thing in the inauguration. Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, someone else had brought that, uh, that up and uh, the Dick Cheney incident was when he was vice president and Correct. he had gone, to, he was representing the U.S. Uh, at a memorial ceremony uh, at Auschwitz. And it oh, was uh, recognizing it was. the liberation of Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And it was an outdoor ceremony uh, soon after the inauguration here. And uh, what was really striking about the, the image of him was that he was sitting outside and he was sitting alongside all these other world leaders who were dressed in you know, black overcoats and, and uh, dress hats and gloves and sort of looking as one might expect if they were attending a funeral for instance. And, you know, Cheney was there in sort of this khaki green parka and ski cap and hiking boots <laughs> and just really looked like he was one, you know, sort of not dressed for the formality of the event as it was, but also just seemed to be dressed for a completely different event. Um, one that was not nearly as sobering. Here's an excerpt from her Dick Cheney article. It is also worth mentioning that Cheney was wearing hiking boots, thick brown lace-up ones. Did he think he was going to have to hike the 44 miles from Krakow, where he had made remarks earlier in the day, to Auschwitz? And when I looked at the Bernie Sanders images from the inauguration, where he is in, you know, sort of this outdoor parka, and he's got you know, just the magnificent mittens on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and clearly I have great affection and I was so amused by that picture. And part of it, I think, is because one ceremony is quite sober and one is, in effect, you know, celebratory. One, um, you know, had someone who was there representing the nation. Uh, standing in for all of America. And, you know, and Bernie was there representing ostensibly Vermont. And he looked, as someone who grew up in Vermont said to me, they thought he was representing the state quite well. <laughs> and, and I think there was also the element of personality as, as well, that, you know, sort of the body position 
uh, just seem to reflect uh, <laughs> so much of how people sort of think of, of Senator Sanders that they could kind of put these notions, these little thought bubbles over his head. Oh my God, that the image became this huge meme. And apparently has raised close to $2 million for charity. What? But it was somewhere about $1.8 million selling merchandise on his website that had some version of the picture on it. That's yeah. excellent. That's an excellent thing, Bernie Sanders. All right, I can get behind that. Here's an excerpt of Robin's January 2021 editorial. Women have been out there rioting and terrorizing, and they were using stilettos, false eyelashes, a professional blowout, and their fair skin as camouflage. The right kind of pretty can sometimes be as protective as a flak jacket. I have to ask you about a recent column you did, and that was exploring the women of the insurrection. They were crazed and, and nutty. What, what is your take on, on those women? And I'm thinking the congresswoman with three names who wants to carry guns and talked about... Marjorie Taylor like, Greene. These crazed women now of the GOP. I don't really quite understand why people don't seem to think that, and you know, and I will say specifically white women, because it does seem to be this, um, this blind spot. I, I don't really understand why they seem to not grasp their potential for being bad people. Or, <laughs> and you know, and that column focused a lot on uh, Melania Trump. And one of the things that was always so striking to me, and it came up with Melania, it also came up with uh, Ivanka, there was this immediate perception that they were to be these moderating forces, that they were clearly not in agreement with things that were unfolding in front of them. And with Mel Melania, it was happening on the left and on the right. Uh, you know, there were her fans who saw her uh, as classy and beautiful and, you know, the most glamorous first lady ever. And then there were these people on the left who kept promoting these memes of her, you know, swatting away a hand and like constantly suggesting that she was being held against her will. Free Melania. I remember that whole... Uh, right. And both yeah. of those things to me seem to be rooted in this idea that they could not somehow square this former model with this, you know, kind of this pudgy guy, you know, and her appearance just sort of giving masking everything else that was going on below the surface. Um, and the same thing, you know, with Ivanka. And I, I think a lot of it also came across with, um, you know, so many of the women who were involved in the storming of the Capitol. It comes across with, uh, you know, with Marjorie Taylor Greene, I think, and uh, Lauren Bobart, I think. Is oh, yes. Oh, right. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, both of them... I think have gotten more of a pass for things that they have said and the way that they have acted um, than certainly black and brown women. You know, I think about um, the way in which people like Representative Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tayyip have been vilified. And they've never suggested, you know, they haven't suggested trying to over for a government <laughs> or shooting anybody or assassinating right. anybody nor has AOC you know I go back to shortly before Gabby Giffords was shot Sarah Palin was mouthing off about different uh, congressional seats that she had her eye on and she had gun sites on on a map and one of the gun sites was on Gabby Giffords district and when she was shot less than a week or so later Woe to the person who suggested that anything Sarah Palin might have done would have anything to do with that. Well, I mean, I don't really know. The Sarah Palin incident was before my time sort of focusing on the subject. But I do think that with the Capitol riot, 
you know, so many people have talked about the way in which um, those rioters were treated versus the protesters this summer. And there definitely, you know, is a kind of deeply rooted sense of who we should be afraid of and what those people look like, who belongs in a place and, and who doesn't. And with the women of the insurrection, there's this deeply rooted sense of what we should think and expect and how we should treat um, you know, white women who, who look a particular way. What's your take on how women on these reality TV shows are portrayed? And do you see any connection between the popularity of reality TV and that kind of like wanting to watch a cat fight or a train wreck type of mentality has connected us? Seeing these women on television with the, the cardboard like false eyelashes and the bad wheeze and the too much makeup and the cat fights, and it's incredibly popular. And we're wondering how that has influenced how people see women, see black women, and, and on a bigger level, how that's influenced culture. Wow, Nancy, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> I, yeah, it, it's something that I, I don't have a definitive answer by any means. I, I find the whole sort of category really fascinating. I mean, it, there's part of me that sort of sees it as part of that category of uh, social media that loves to transform black women into memes mm. and to use their expressiveness or their, their physicality as generic sort of exclamation points, um, you know? And I find that troubling because I think it happens so often with black women that to me, it just sort of goes to this idea that um, you know, they're not individuals, they're, they don't have the same, uh, they're not given the same level of, of respect and humanity and personality and character um, that, um, you know, their white counterparts are. Um, they, I think too often are used uh, for um, comedic relief. And I find that troubling. And, you know, maybe it's because I take it personally to some degree, but I, I do find it troubling. And, you know, and I, I think it's a, a fine line because, you know, clearly there are, you know, there are black women who are very expressive. And some of those quote unquote cliches are very much legitimately part of their personality. And so when that comes through, um, it's almost as if their own individuality has been sort of co-opted by the culture. And so what they're doing no longer even belongs to them. It's become this other thing that exists outside of them. And, you know, I sort of feel the same way. Like every time I, when I see, um, you know, like the character of Medea, that it drives me crazy <laughs> because I find it to be, um, caricaturing and, and insulting. And yet I also understand that there are pe other people who see that character and find something incredibly um, familiar mm -hmm. and heartwarming about it and authentic. So I think it sort of cuts both ways. But I, I think that I would feel less conflicted if it didn't feel as though it's always black women who get that treatment. Um, and certainly I, I would say that there are a lot of Latinas who get that treatment as well. Um, the sort of finger snapping, sassy, sassy tongued uh, <laughs> character, but like where it comes from and, you know, and do I think that there's, with reality television, do I think that some women just sort of play into it because they know that it will get them more airtime that, and with airtime comes more potential for branding and with branding comes more money. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, quite possibly. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that um, the business of false eyelashes has been the same since <laughs> the early aughts. <laughs> 
it is a cottage industry in and of itself. I mean, some of them look like pieces of cardboard. They're so thick, you know, but yeah, I digress. You know, like a couple, I think, was it last year, maybe the year before that, I did an entire feature that was just about false eyelashes oh, because yeah. I was so obsessed with it. And, you know, like interviewed, you know, one of the, the uh, communications directors for like, you know, the largest producer of false eyelashes or something in the country. It was just, it was crazy. I was obsessed. <laughs> Kiss on the hand may be quite continental, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. A kiss may be Hi, this is Carol. Carol Channing. And yes, diamonds are a girl's best friend. But lashes, a close second. It's true. Oh my goodness, I don't know where I'd be without my lashes. You know, eyelashes have been a symbol of beauty for youth as far back as the Egyptian pharaohs. And in ancient Rome, a philosopher wrote that your lashes would fall out from all that orgy sex. Seriously. So women look to those long curly lashes to prove their chastity. It's true. Then, in the late 1900s in London and Paris, it was popular to get an actual eyelash transplant. Hairs that were pulled from your head were threaded into your eyelids. <laughs> Honestly, they rub your eyelids with a cocaine solution to kill the pain during the procedure. It's true. And then, in 1911, Anna Taylor patented the glue on false eyelash. Good looking out, sister. And then, in 1916, while filming a silent film, Intolerance, director G.W. Griffith wanted his actress, Cena Owen, to have that fluttery lash look, so he had his wig maker glue false eyelashes onto her lids using spirit gum. That's not good. She looked great on camera, but the next day, her eyes were swollen shut. It's true. But let me tell you, the modern eyelashes were pioneered by Max Factor, who was an absolute makeup genius. Actually, the critics call me a genius when I played Dolly Levi on Broadway and all over the world for over 5,000 performances. But I digress. Make them longer or thicker. Big eyes are the kicker. Lashes are a girl's best friend. It's true. I used to watch Style with Elsa Clench. Oh, and, TV show, right? Yes. And they followed all the runway shows in New York, Paris, Milan, and London. They would interview um, fashion writers afterwards for their opinions. That's where I first saw Robin, and she had on um, a headband, like a tortoiseshell <laughs> headband. And I always wore headbands, and you know, I'd gotten older, and I thought, oh God, I have to stop wearing headbands. I'm not 10 anymore. And I thought, she looks great with her headband. And then I was so impressed, you know, who she was and her opinion of the show. And of course, she was a black woman, so you know, that piqued my interest. And, um, and then for, I would watch every week, not only for the fashions, but to see if Robin would come on and give her review of the, of the runway show. Right. And then when we, uh, we, we booked her for the podcast, I got really excited. Did you ever worry when you were covering uh, or, or writing about a particular designer that something that you said could like be the death blow to that designer. I always have been curious about the role of a critic and how critics approach being critics. Well, I don't, I can only speak for myself, but what I try to do is to sort of write within the context of the brand. And by that, I mean, if I'm writing about a brand like Chanel 
which has every advantage, has deep, deep archives, essentially owns practically all of its uh, production facilities, uh, you know, from the embroidery houses to the, the, the lace makers. Um, for a brand like Chanel to have a show that feels muddled or not particularly well executed, um, to me is, you know, is a much more grievous <laughs> crime than, um, you know, an independent designer who's been in business for a couple of years who had to produce their collection on a couple thousand dollars and a prayer. Mm-hmm. The hurdles that have to, that had to have been overcome are very different. And the goals you know, are very different. The constraints are very different. And so I try to take all of those contextual issues into consideration when I'm writing about what I'm seeing. Uh, That said, I also tend to believe that, you know, if you are going to step out um, onto a stage as large as a runway, that you should absolutely know what you want to say, that you should have clarified uh, your thinking, and um, that you should you know, be articulate in, in, what you're, in what you're presenting. I would much rather see a smaller brand show me 10 magnificent pieces that are, so, that are very cohesive and thoughtful um, than for that person to try and produce 30. Hmm. I'd rather see just uh, an, an installation, a walkthrough, um, than uh, a big runway show. Hmm. Because I think uh, for, for smaller brands, because I think big runway shows um, automatically set your expectations at a, at a higher level. This is the Pulitzer excerpt about Jennifer Lopez's fashion line. The show was called The J-Lo Story and was organized into three parts. The opening segment celebrated the up from the Bronx portion of Lopez's life. There was a lot of cropped denim, hot pants, tiny jackets, and hoop earrings. Apparently, Lopez did not own a coat during this portion of her life and spent much of the winter dressed in miniskirts. As a teenager in college, I didn't have a subscription to a fashion magazine. I never had a subscription to a fashion magazine. Um, I, you know, I I would hang out at the mall with my friends because that's what you did in Michigan in high school. (laughs) Um, But I had no particular interest in like high-end fashion. And in fact, the first time um, I was sent to Paris to uh, cover the collections. I was kind of filling in uh, for the incoming actual fashion editor. And, you know, my editor, the features editor had said to me, you know, you don't, you don't need to be a critic, just go and, and report, uh, which is what I did. Um, but before I went, the outgoing fashion editor gave me a list of the fashion houses whose shows I should go to and which ones I should skip. And a friend from high school, like, gave me a pep talk on uh, fashion. And I think, you know, I had heard of Chanel and Dior. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could not have told you anything specifically about them. Honestly, it would have been as if I had suddenly been shifted into the sports department. Wow. And someone said, okay, we have an actual baseball writer coming in, but if you can just go – and like report from spring training for like the first week and then someone's going to come in and you know like an expert's going to come in and take over i would have honestly been like okay google spring training (laughs) (laughs) so and so sometimes yeah i mean there is an advantage to being the person who is kind of asking the not the stupid question but sort of the obvious question yeah, so that it's not just inside baseball, which is a problem I had 
my whole life with a lot of political shows too, even now where people are throwing acronyms around and everyone's talking at this level that only people who are in the know would understand things. It's, it's why someone who can just explain what's really going on is so powerful. Uh, well, hey, I've already Googled reconciliation and fil <laughs> filibuster because... <laughs> can't keep it straight. I can't. Is reconciliation just having a majority or is it... See, I can't keep it straight. <laughs> you know, I, I have to check every okay. single time. I uh, <laughs> like hear someone talking about it in, the, in various contexts. I can't explain reconciliation either. It's too damn hard. But filibuster I can do. Okay. A filibuster is someone from the Senate minority party standing in front of Congress talking useless smack, sometimes for hours, sometimes for an entire day to stall a bill from being considered. It's a maneuver that frustrates the majority party and slows up the president's flow. We want to ask something that we find to be like a real pressing question in these days of politics and Black Lives Matter and just, you know, serious times. <laughs> Are you a shoe person or a purse person? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that I'm a, a shoe person. Tell us why. Why would you be a <laughs> handbag person? Some people are. I'm a shoe person. I think Nancy's more a purse person. Well, you know what? I'm an evolving person, and that's part of why it's so great to talk to you, because I've learned a lot about just how important fashion is. Like, my whole notion of what you wear and what it says about you has really blossomed. I mean, I think I'm a, a, a shoe person in part because I think that having to swap a handbag on a daily basis is just Crazy. far too much trouble. And so I tend to invest in a handbag that I feel can be an every single day bag. And then I carry that bag probably for years. And then maybe, you know, I'll buy a, another one. Um, but I also am a firm believer in drawing a line between the day work bag and an evening bag. Mm. One of my pet peeves is to, is when people go to a, a cocktail party or some more, some dressier event at the end of the day. And they've gone through the trouble of perhaps adding some jewelry or uh, swapping out their shoes, but they're walking around with a handbag that's big enough to hold a laptop. <laughs> and I always think, and I've seen this happen, uh, you know, at parties. I've seen this at the White House. What? And there is part of me that's just like, if there is one place where I think you could check your bag and it would be safe, <laughs> and you could probably check it there. You could probably leave even your wallet in the bag uh, and not have to walk around with this giant, you know, laptop satchel. So back to the shoes for a minute. What's your heel height? Well, I suppose it depends on the event and my mode of transportation. <laughs> yeah, sure, that makes practical sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if it's a cocktail party and I'm going to be standing, you know, I will, might be walking over or something like that, then, you know, I'm a firm believer in wearing heels that make sense and that are comfortable enough to walk in or to stand in. So maybe they're like a little, you know, a two inch heel or something. Um, and then, if it's a dinner party where I'm going to be seated for 95% of the evening mm -hmm. uh, and then just like getting into an Uber or something afterwards, then I think that's an opportunity to wear a pair of completely impractical <laughs> yet gorgeous shoes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nancy Wyatt was talking to me about, now Nancy, you might have to jump in and explain like the, the, the height of a heel and the correlation between, what was that? The level of your education relates 
to your heel. The higher the heel, the less of an education you have. And I always, that always used to come back to my mind. Let the records show that my mouth is ajar in amazement. <laughs> yes. I, think, I think this metric is slightly different than you wearing a high heel to a big fashion event. But go on, Nancy. I wanna, I wanna... Um, that's just all I heard. And, and whenever I saw Melania with her insane heels, I was thinking, what is she thinking? That's just so, as a first lady, I just found those high heels too, too much. Well, I mean, I, you know, I've never been one to wear a super, super uh, yeah. high stiletto like that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I do, I have known people who do, who, mm -hmm. who did. And certainly, you know, one of the things they have often said is that the more you wear them, the more you get used to them and the more comfortable-ish mm -hmm. they become. Um, I mean, wow. I, I had a cousin who said that she actually found, you know, flats to be very uncomfortable and really almost always wore heels. And part of that was simply because of, you know, what she was, what she was used to. But, you know, I, you know, just don't have the, the balance and skill to navigate through life in a pair of heels like that. And I also don't have the life in which I spend most of my time being picked up at the front door. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's a that was very thoughtful because I've also seen women and their heels as a power symbol. What about that? Well, I think some of it's psychological, and I, I mean, I do think that the addition of the height um, can sometimes be perceived as uh, making someone look more authoritative, more um, the dominant person in the room. Um, I always feel a bit more uh, in control of the, the situation if I have the ability to look everyone in the eye. Mm. Um, and, you know, I used to joke when I lived in New York, um, I would certainly not wear, you know, spindly heels on the subway, but, you know, a good chunky heel was always nice because to me, there's nothing worse than being in a crowded subway car and looking people in the chest. <laughs> I want to be at a height at which I'm either eye to eye or looking over people. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I didn't mean to interrupt. This is something that's bothered me for the longest time. And again, I have a very limited sense of fashion. What makes a Birkin bag worth twenty thousand plus dollars? Can you please break it down to me? Well, my first question to me to you would be, how are you defining worth? I guess my question back to you, because I can't answer it, is question mark, question mark, question mark. Like, I mean, are, I mean, I know it's, it's probably handcrafting. And I mean, are time. there twenty thousand dollars worth of materials and labor and so forth in it? Um, no, but um, it is one of the few luxury handbags that really is, you know, sort of produced by people stitching it, mm -hmm. um, and you know, they really do look at the the skins to make sure that they are, you know, the best skins and, you know, the, everything lines up just so. And the right. hardware is, you know, silver plated, gold plated, it's embossed. So you know that it's authentic, that it hasn't been, you know, knocked off by some, someone or something. Um, it's, you know, the quality of it is wonderful. Um, it's also one of the few sort of fashion purchases that you can make that really actually retains a lot of, of its value. Wow. Um, a Birkin on the resale market is still quite valuable. Um, you know, you're not going to walk into a, a thrift shop, a, retail, a resale shop, and see a Birkin for a couple hundred bucks. Right. Okay. Even if it's like 15 years old. Um, so, you know, that's one thing. And, you know, they, there's not like tons of them on the market. I mean, they're very good about sort of keeping supply a little bit under demand. That's um, part of the allure, right? Are these long waiting lists and... And yeah, and it also is one of those things that it's, you know, it doesn't go on sale. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not, you're not going to get a deal on, wow. right. That's you perfect. know, you're not going to get like the end of season sale on the Birkin. <laughs> and so it has retained this element of aspiration 
that a lot of other brands sort of chip away at by, you know, many doing a lot of things to the brand, whether it's um, selling it at a reduced cost or what have you. Um, and it also, you know, has this aura that has only been heightened over the years that it is, um, you know, this really special rarefied item. Um, it does live up to its reputation for quality. And it's also a great design. You know, it's a bag that is really not meant to be this precious thing that's kept in a dust cover uh, on a high shelf in your closet. It's meant to be a work bag. It's meant to be used. It's meant to have like, you know, your laptop and a bottle of water and, you know, crap thrown into it. So there's also that very odd and shocking thing, which is that it's a really practical design. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm, you've educated me. I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, years ago when Martha Stewart was on trial, um, she mm -hmm. walked into court in New York with a Birkin. Mm -hmm. And I was quite stunned. And I remember calling her attorney and asking, <laughs> why, why is your client who's on trial for basically uh, feeling that she was above the law and above the rules, walking in with a, a handbag that is the epitome of exclusivity? And she had a very good legal team <laughs> because one of her lawyers got back to me and said, it is Mar Martha's favorite bag. And uh, she bought it uh, many years ago, right after her company became a success. And it was a reward to her for her hard work. Um, and it's a bag that she carries all the time. Wow. Robin has written two books. Michelle, her first year as first lady about Michelle Obama. And coming up, she talks about her first book, The Battle of Versailles, the night American fashion stumbled into the spotlight and made history. The book, Look, is a, a cultural history of uh, the, a fashion show that took place at Versailles um, in the 70s, in the early 70s, uh, that featured five American and five French designers and it was really a moment when the American industry was very much in the shadow of the French industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ready to Wear was really just starting to sort of find its legs. Most women of note and money were still much more focused on couture. And uh, a very savvy publicist, Eleanor Lambert, in, in New York really wanted to elevate the reputation of American designers on the world stage. And when she was asked by the curator at Versailles to organize a, a fundraising event uh, for, to help with its restoration, uh, she conceived of this fashion show. And it was really women's wear that kind of set it up as a, as a battle. Um, you know, pitting the Americans uh, against the French, which at that point was really an unfair uh, <laughs> uh, battle because the French had so many uh. advantages. But the Americans ended up really acquitting themselves quite well through a series of accidents and mistakes and good fortune. Um, and one of the, the key reasons uh, that the Americans did so well was because of the three dozen models that they flew over to Paris with them, um, about a third of them were black. Those women had a real presence on the runway and really brought the clothes to life, which was necessary because their clothes were really quite simple compared mm. to the work of the French. You know, you had people like Stephen Burroughs and Halston, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, whose work was really mm -hmm. dependent on the movement of the body wearing the clothing. And the, particularly the black models could really move and express themselves on the runway. And they inspired a lot of the other models to, to do the same thing. And it really sort of signaled uh, a moment, a transformative moment, for the fashion industry. 
That and, is great. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a lot of fun to to research it, mm -hmm. and I was fascinated just by all the things that were sort of going on culturally during this time period. You know, everything from the riots that happened um, in the late '60s, the causes. Uh, for so much racial unrest and suggesting remedies going forward. There's also unrest, civil unrest in Paris uh, in 1968, um, which was really, you know, kind of a, a youth uprising to some degree. So there were so many, all of those things kind of conspired to create this, this kind of fertile ground for something to change and uh, to sort of transform the fashion industry. Who were the other designers, American designers? Uh, the five Americans were um, Halston, Bill Blass, Oscar de la Renta, uh, Stephen Burroughs, and Anne Klein. Yeah. It was a bit of a motley crew, right? Uh -huh. Sort of an odd mix of, of designers. Uh, and then the fr on the French side, it was uh, Emmanuel Ungaro, mm -hmm. Yves Saint Laurent, Givenchy, um, Pierre Cardin, and uh, Mark Bohan, who was the designer at Dior. That sounds exciting. I love the idea that black women really like, you know, brought it home for America. <laughs> <laughs> And this is the end of the Robin Show. Ooh, 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 that was bad. Okay. Thanks to our guest, Pulitzer Prize winning Washington Post journalist Robin Givon. Hey, do yourself a favor and read her editorials every chance you get. She is so smart, witty, and deep. And special thanks to our friend Emmett Foster for bringing the legendary Carol Channing hilariously back to life for a tutorial on eyelashes. We love you, Emmett! The Giles Files was created by Nancy Giles and Nancy Wyatt, produced, directed, and edited by Nancy Wyatt, and recorded at our studios in Weehawken, New Jersey. We'll be back next week with another boffo episode of The Giles Files. Okay? Bye! Huda Media Production.